nine. Ignition sequence. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Just one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. And mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and it's come to a final stop. Im US-Haushaltsstreit hat Präsident Obama vor den wirtschaftlichen Folgen gewarnt, sollten sich Demokraten und Republikaner nicht noch auf einen Kompromiss einigen. Zentraler Streitpunkt ist eine höhere Besteuerung reicher Amerikaner. Obama ist dafür, die Republikaner lehnen eine solche Maßnahme ab. Kommt es bis zum Jahreswechsel zu keiner Einigung, treten automatisch Steuererhöhungen für alle Amerikaner und massive Ausgabenkürzungen in Kraft. In Moskau haben der russische Außenminister Lavrov und der internationale Sonderbeauftragte Brahimi über die Lage in Syrien beraten. Beide äußerten die Hoffnung, dass eine politische Lösung des Bürgerkriegs möglich ist. Brahimi forderte, alle Anstrengungen darauf auszurichten. Lavrov kritisierte, dass die syrische Opposition Verhandlungen mit dem Assad-Regime abgelehnt hat. Die Opposition hatte als Bedingung für Gespräche einen Rücktritt von Präsident Assad genannt. Bei einem Flugzeugunglück am Moskauer Flughafen Vnukovo sind vier Menschen ums Leben gekommen. Die Maschine der Fluggesellschaft Red Wings war über die Landebahn hinausgeschossen. An Bord befanden sich acht Besatzungsmitglieder, aber keine Passagiere. Die Überlebenden erlitten schwere Verletzungen. Als Ursache kommt nach ersten Angaben der Ermittlungsbehörden ein Pilotenfehler in Betracht. Ein spektakuläres Amateurvideo zeigt jetzt, mit welcher Wucht die Maschine von der Landebahn abkam und zerschellte. Daniela Schulz berichtet. Es sind diese Aufnahmen aus einem vorbeifahrenden Auto, die den Moment der Bruchlandung dokumentieren. Das Flugzeug ist über die Landebahn geschossen und wird erst von der Böschung der Schnellstraße gestoppt. Obwohl Fahrzeuge von Trümmerteilen getroffen werden, kommt wie durch ein Wunder kein Autofahrer zu Schaden. Vier Besatzungsmitglieder der Unglücksmaschine kommen ums Leben. Ein fünftes Crewmitglied stirbt später im Krankenhaus an seinen Verletzungen. Den ganzen Tag überlaufen die Aufräumarbeiten. Immer wieder kommen Menschen zur Unfallstelle, um ihr Mitgefühl auszudrücken. Es tut mir so leid für die Opfer. Mein Beileid gilt den betroffenen Familien. Ich weiß nicht, was mit Russland los ist. Hier geht es mit allem bergab, auch mit der Flugzeugindustrie. Aus Ermittlerkreisen heißt es, dass möglicherweise defekte Bremsen für das Unglück verantwortlich waren. Aus irgendeinem Grund war der Pilot nicht in der Lage, die Maschine zu stoppen. Es war eine sehr erfahrene Crew. Der Pilot hatte über 15.000 Flugstunden. An Bord waren insgesamt acht Menschen. Ein Handyvideo, das kurz nach dem Aufprall entstand, zeigt die dramatische Rettungsaktion. Drei Schwerverletzte kämpfen immer noch in Moskauer Kliniken um ihr Leben. Ihnen und den Hinterbliebenen der fünf Todesopfer will die Fluggesellschaft jetzt ein Schmerzensgeld von jeweils mehreren 10.000 Euro zahlen. Der Wolkenkratzer ist mit über 541 Metern eines der höchsten Gebäude der Welt. Und seine Erbauer haben in Sachen Sicherheit vieles aus der Katastrophe von 2001 gelernt. Wie das genau aussieht und was die Eröffnung für die Stadt und für die Menschen bedeutet, das zeigt unser US-Korrespondent Carsten Mirke. Das neue Jahr bringt New York eine neue Skyline. Und diese Animation nimmt den Blick schon mal vorweg. 2013 nämlich soll das One World Trade Center endlich fertig sein. Noch allerdings wird an der Spitze des künftig höchsten Wolkenkratzers der USA eifrig gebaut. Dieses Gebäude steht für Erneuerung, Lebenskraft und Rückkehr zur Normalität nach den Schrecken des 11. September 2001. Fast 3000 Menschen starben damals. Über viele Jahre wurde aus dem einst lebendigen Finanzviertel eine Geisterstadt. Die Wiedereröffnung 2013 können vor allem auch umliegende Geschäftsleute kaum erwarten. Wenn das World Trade Center wieder da ist, wollen auch wir wieder rund um die Uhr aufhaben. Das ist gut fürs Geschäft. Doch Wirtschaftskrise und die Angst vor neuen Terroranschlägen auf die exponierten Türme macht die Suche nach neuen Mietern nicht einfach. Dabei wurde für die Sicherheit der Bauten viel getan. Bis zu ein Meter dicker Stahlbeton zum Beispiel sichert die Fahrstuhlschächte, erfahren wir. In den Treppenhäusern herrscht Überdruck, damit kein Rauch eindringen kann. Alle Fluchtwege bieten höchste Sicherheit. Wir haben viel, viel gelernt vom 11. September. Das fertige World Trade Center Nummer 7 zum Beispiel ist zu 100 Prozent belegt. 
die große Nummer 1 bislang erst zu rund 60 Prozent. Seit über zehn Jahren, seit dem 11. September, ist hier im Finanzviertel die Angst vor Terroranschlägen allgegenwärtig. Aber spätestens seit Supersturm Sandy kommt eine neue Bedrohung hinzu, die Natur. Tunnel und Keller liefen voll Wasser und selbst jetzt noch rattern im Finanzviertel überall die Generatoren, weil der Strom fehlt. All dies kann uns nicht passieren, versichern die Betreiber des World Trade Centers und freuen sich auf 2013 mit Manhattans neuer Skyline. Noch ist im US-Haushaltsstreit keine Lösung gefunden. Deshalb auch heute wieder Krisentreffen und ein leidenschaftlicher Appell des Präsidenten. Gibt es bis morgen Abend keinen Kompromiss, dann stürzen die USA über die sogenannte Fiskalklippe. Die Folgen wären drastische Steuererhöhungen und Kürzungen im Haushalt. Aus Washington, Ralf Goldmann. In den US-Medien zählen sie schon den Countdown. Die Haushaltsklippe rückt näher und damit massive Steuererhöhungen für die Bürger. Im Kongress arbeiten Demokraten und Republikaner Tag und Nacht an einer Einigung. Und Präsident Obama gibt sich in einem Interview optimistisch. Unsere oberste Priorität muss sein, dass die Steuern für die Mittelschichtfamilien nicht ansteigen. Das würde unsere Wirtschaft hart treffen und ich denke, wir können das noch hinkriegen. Der Senat trifft sich zur Stunde, um einen Gesetzesentwurf vorzubereiten. Der muss dann noch durchs Abgeordnetenhaus, in dem die Republikaner die Mehrheit haben. Doch die ersten scheinen nachzugeben. Es wird ein politischer Sieg für den Präsidenten sein und ich hoffe, wir haben dann den Mut, für unsere Interessen zu kämpfen, wenn es später um eine neue Schuldenobergrenze geht. Aber Hut ab vor dem Präsidenten, er hat gewonnen. Obamas Demokraten wollen weiterhin Gutverdienende mit Einkommen über 250.000 Dollar im Jahr stärker belasten. Und für zwei Millionen Arbeitslose soll es auch im Januar finanzielle Hilfen geben. Es scheint, als könnten die USA in allerletzter Minute den Sprung über die Fiskalklippe vermeiden. Einige Signale stehen zumindest auf Einigung. Doch es liegt jetzt daran, wie viele Republikaner für einen Kompromiss stimmen werden oder nicht. Noch an Silvester muss es zur entscheidenden Abstimmung kommen, wenn automatische Steuererhöhungen vermieden werden sollen. In der Eurokrise mahnt US-Präsident Obama die Europäer oft und gerne, sich doch bitte zusammenzuraufen, weil schließlich die ganze Weltwirtschaft von einem Scheitern des Euro betroffen wäre. Jetzt gefährdet der Haushaltsstreit in den USA die Weltwirtschaft, aber die politischen Lager raufen sich einfach nicht zusammen. Wenn das bis zum Silvesterabend so bleibt, dann treten automatisch so drastische Steuererhöhungen und Ausgabenkürzungen in Kraft, dass die USA in eine Rezession stürzen könnten. Und wir mit. Und so schaut die ganze Welt auf das Kapitol in Washington, wo die beiden Parteien miteinander ringen. Alexandra Fleskes. Unruhiges Warten, nervöser Countdown am Tag vor der Entscheidung. Die US-Nachrichtensendungen überschlagen sich, was passiert gerade in den Verhandlungen über die Fiskalklippe. Seit dem Mittag tagt der Senat im Kapitol, um einen Kompromiss zu finden. Aber es tut sich nichts. Zur Stagnation kommt Frustration beim demokratischen Verhandlungsführer. An einem bestimmten Punkt in diesem Prozess scheint es jetzt Dinge zu geben, die uns davon abhalten, voranzukommen. Ich hoffe aber immer noch, dass wir etwas hinbekommen. Das andauernde Hin und Her macht Mürbe. Die Republikaner haben sich jetzt einen Vermittler gesucht. Der demokratische Vizepräsident Joe Biden soll sich in die Verhandlungen einbringen. Vielleicht kann er die Verhandlungen auf seiner Seite wieder etwas auf Touren bringen. Der Vizepräsident und ich haben schon einmal an Lösungen gearbeitet und ich denke, das können wir nochmal. In einem Fernsehinterview machte Präsident Obama am Morgen klar, dass es auch am Tag vor der Entscheidung nicht ohne Schuldzuweisungen geht. Ich habe den Republikanern dazu so faire Angebote gemacht, dass ich Ärger mit vielen meiner Demokraten hatte. Aber so, wie sich die Republikaner verhalten, ist das einzige große Thema, wo die sich einig sind, offenbar die Steuervergünstigungen für Reiche zu verteidigen. Die Republikaner nannten den Präsidenten daraufhin führungsschwach. Und so gehen die letzten Stunden ins Land, in denen sich die zerstrittenen Politiker einigen könnten. Am Abend sollen sie dem Repräsentantenhaus einen Kompromiss vorlegen. Eine Zitterpartie für das ganze Land. Herr Stefan Niemann in Washington, im Augenblick verhandelt also der Senat noch. Über welchen Kompromissvorschlag überhaupt? 
Ja, im Moment über keinen. Das sieht nach einer langen Nacht aus. Die Konfliktparteien haben sich schon wieder hoffnungslos verhakt hier. Das liegt daran, dass die Republikaner offenbar einen Vorschlag gemacht haben, den die Demokraten so nicht akzeptieren wollen. Die Republikaner möchten, dass wenn sie einer sogenannten Reichensteuer zustimmen, dass in diesem Deal dann auch eine verbindliche Zusage für den Abbau des Haushaltsdefizites drin ist, also Schuldenabbau verbindlich. Das wollen sie sich festschreiben und versprechen lassen. Und daran hakt es im Moment seit Stunden schon. Und äh, obwohl es nur noch knapp 31 30 Stunden Zeit ist bis zu dieser endgültigen Frist, ist schon wieder Zeit für politische Spielchen. Das heißt, Demokraten und Republikaner reden schlecht übereinander hier im Fernsehen, anstatt vernünftig miteinander. Es hört sich ja nicht gut an. Und selbst wenn der Senat sich einigen würde, dann müsste ja auch noch die zweite Kammer des Kongresses zustimmen. Also wie aussichtsreich ist denn das überhaupt in diesen 31 Stunden, wie Sie sagen? Ja, also ich bin nicht sehr optimistisch angesichts dieses Stillstandes jetzt, muss ich ganz offen sagen. Die Hürde im Repräsentantenhaus ist in der Tat noch höher. Sie haben recht, weil die Republikaner dort in der Mehrheit sind. Und von den Republikanern sind viele so auf Krawall gebürstet, dass man gar nicht glauben mag, dass sie überhaupt einen Kompromiss noch wollen. Also im Moment stehen die Zeichen eher für ein fundamentales Scheitern hier kurz vor Silvester und für die Fiskalklippe, dass sie dann kommt und das im Januar aufgeräumt und repariert werden muss, was die da gerade im Kapitol kaputt zu machen drohen. So sieht es jedenfalls zur Stunde aus, wenn kein Wunder passiert. Keine guten Nachrichten, nicht nur für die USA, sondern auch für die Weltwirtschaft. Vielen Dank, Stefan Niemann nach Washington. In Island haben starker Wind, heftiger Schneefall und Lawinen das öffentliche Leben weitgehend lahmgelegt. Viele Straßen mussten gesperrt werden. Die Behörden haben den Bürgern geraten, ihre Häuser möglichst nicht zu verlassen. In einigen Gebieten ist die Stromversorgung zusammengebrochen. Well, that's the question that all Washington, nay all America, is asking itself at the moment. Why is it that Congress is unable to come together to prevent a massive package of austerity measures taking effect on January the 1st? A package of austerity measures that almost nobody wants and pretty much everybody has agreed would hurt Americans a great deal. Now, these austerity measures, if they did take hold, would be very good for cutting the deficit in the United States, and that's why they were originally designed to take shape. But everybody agrees that tax rises plus massive government spending cuts, as they are due to take effect in, as you say, just under 23 hours' time, will probably slow the American economy, possibly even push it into a new recession, and would be damaging even for the total global economy as well. So why indeed Congress isn't able to come together? It's a very divided Congress. There are deep uh, uh, differences in ideology and principle between the two parties. And both parties are hanging very tough, even now, right up to the last moment. Um, and is it a case, Adam, that uh, neither side wants to be seen to be voting for effectively tax rises? Is that what it comes down to? That's one of the major sticking points. President Obama has said that in order to help bring down America's enormous government deficit, there must be some tax rises, only little ones, that would affect about the top 2% of the population. The Republicans say no, even that's too much. They won't vote through any plan that has those tax rises involved in it. There are other issues here as well, uh, but, but that's one of the principal sticking points, yes. Um, what are the people of America saying to their lawmakers, to their representatives? I mean, are they incensed? Are they, are they completely uh, taken up with these negotiations that are going on in Washington and, and passing on a message to them, you know, get your act together? Well, certainly the sense I get is that many Americans are deeply frustrated with Congress and its ability, inability to find compromises on really important national issues like this one. However, small activist parts of each party's base. And I think it's probably fair to say, particularly on the Republican side, the very, very strong libertarian anti-tax Republican Party base have been working very hard to influence their representatives in Congress not to give in. And I think it's fair to say that many Republicans in Congress are very worried that if they are seen to support even to sanction any rises in tax, then they may find themselves in trouble when the next uh, congressional elections come around uh, in two years' time. 
All right, thank you very much for now, Adam. I suggest you get some sleep because you're going to be uh, back on duty in just a few hours as uh, those negotiations, those wrangles in uh, Capitol Hill continue today. Wir sehen Live-Bilder aus Tokio in der japanischen Hauptstadt. Wird in diesen Sekunden das neue Jahr 2013 begrüßt mit einem Gongschlag. Die größte Stadt Japans, 25 Millionen Menschen, sie feiern in diesen Minuten mit einer traditionellen Zeremonie das neue Jahr. Bereits um 11 Uhr unserer Zeit konnten die ersten Menschen in Ozeanien 2013 willkommen heißen. Seitdem wandert die Mitternachtszeitzone immer weiter gen Westen, ist jetzt in Japan, wird später Europa erreichen, bevor dann morgen um 11 Uhr unserer Zeit die Menschen auf Hawaii als letzte 2013 willkommen heißen. Und schon vor genau zwei Stunden hat Australien 2013 gefeiert. Sängerin Kylie Minogue gab in Sydney den Startschuss für ein gigantisches Feuerwerk. Besonderes Highlight, die funkelnde Harbour Bridge, eines der Wahrzeichen der Stadt. Über zehn Minuten lang erstrahlte der Himmel über dem Hafen von Sydney und auch vom Booten aus wurden Raketen abgefeuert. Das Ganze unterlegt von dramatischer Musik und den Charts zum Tanzen und feiern. Und auch Berlin rüstet sich für Deutschlands größte Silvesterparty. Am Brandenburger Tor soll um Mitternacht ein gigantisches Feuerwerk den Hauptstadthimmel erleuchten und 2013 willkommen heißen. Die Veranstalter rechnen damit, dass auch hier bis zu eine Million Menschen auf die Partymeile strömen werden. Noch ist hier reichlich Platz, aber schon bald sollen sich hier auf Europas größter Partymeile rund eine Million Menschen drängeln. Und denen wird eine Menge geboten. Nicht nur ein riesiges Feuerwerk, sondern auch zahlreiche Live-Acts. Auf vielen, vielen Showbühnen sollen hier zum Beispiel Bonnie Tyler, die Pet Shop Boys oder Jürgen Drees auftreten. Und dann gibt es kurz vor Mitternacht hier noch einen riesigen Flashmob. Hunderttausende sollen gemeinsam den Gunman-Style tanzen. Ausgelassene Stimmung zum Jahresende also und die Menschen scheinen zuversichtlich ins neue Jahr zu blicken. Die Neujahresansprache der Bundeskanzlerin hingegen, die gab eher wenig Grund zu Optimismus. Von schwierigen Zeiten ist da die Rede und auch von einer Finanzkrise, die längst nicht überwunden sei. Dennoch ruft Angela Merkel die Deutschen auch dazu auf, Mut zu zeigen. Die Reformen, die wir beschlossen haben, beginnen zu wirken. Dennoch brauchen wir weiterhin viel Geduld. Die Krise ist noch längst nicht überwunden. Und auch international muss noch mehr getan werden, um die Finanzmärkte besser zu überwachen. Die Welt hat die Lektion der verheerenden Finanzkrise von 2008 noch nicht ausreichend gelernt. Doch nie wieder darf sich eine solche Verantwortungslosigkeit wie damals durchsetzen. In der sozialen Marktwirtschaft ist der Staat der Hüter der Ordnung. Darauf müssen die Menschen vertrauen können. Überall auf der Welt feiern die Menschen den Beginn des neuen Jahres. Die Uhr tickt im negativen Sinne auch für die Leute in den USA, denn die schauen eher mit Sorge auf den nahenden Jahreswechsel. Der US-Senat hat in der Nacht seine Verhandlungen zum Haushaltsstreit ergebnislos vertagt. Die Gespräche zwischen Republikanern und Demokraten werden dann wohl am Vormittag amerikanischer Zeit wieder aufgenommen. Der Mehrheitsführer der Demokraten, Harry Reid, ist mittlerweile von den Verhandlungen aber zurückgetreten. Der Kongress hat nur noch wenige Stunden Zeit, um vor dem Ende des Jahres zu einer Einigung zu gelangen. Andernfalls greifen unter anderem automatische Steuererhöhungen. Die USA würden dann, so fürchten viele, in eine Rezession fallen. Liebe Zuschauer, Bilder aus Shanghai, wie überall auf der Welt, lassen die Menschen auch hier die Sektkorken knallen oder feiern auf andere Art und Weise das neue Jahr. Und in sechs Sekunden ist es in China soweit, 2013, das neue Jahr hat begonnen. Die Chinesen feiern seit Jahrzehnten unser neues Jahr, haben aber eigentlich ein eigenes Kalendersystem und das chinesische Jahr, das wird erst im Februar beginnen. Aber hier wird jetzt gefeiert und zwar so wie vielleicht an vielen Orten auf der Welt mit dem Gangnam Style. Night has arrived in Asia, in Hong Kong. They're calling it a pyrotechnic musical. The first time they'll launch fireworks from land and sea. The fireworks actually were scheduled to begin an hour before midnight. Hong Kong on CNN.com's list of uh, top 10 places to ring in the new year. Let's listen.
Bringing the new year from Hong Kong to Beijing to Taipei to Manila. Good morning, 2013 in much of Asia. We'll continue to monitor uh, all of these grand celebrations as the day rolls on, the night rolls on in some cases. Midnight in the U.S., of course, is the big fiscal cliff deadline. There really are two fronts we need to be watching today, uh, Capitol Hill and Wall Street. We're going to get to the market reaction a little later. Uh, right now, let's see if there's any movement on Capitol Hill. Uh, stock market's moving up and very erratic of the stock market because it's a little erratic. I'm Capitol Hill this morning. CNN senior congressional correspondent Dana Bass is watching that live for us. Um, Dana, last hour you were saying progress is being made. Now, um, you've been hearing rumblings from on the opposite, from the far left. What are you hearing right now? Very interesting. You know, we have been hearing from both sides of the aisle that part of the big issue, the hurdle, has been to get over objections from conservative Republicans who are not going to be happy uh, with this any potential deal. I just spoke with Senator Tom Harkin, who is a veteran Senate uh, Democrat. You know him well, being from Iowa, Christine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and he's also a leading progressive. He said that he and other progressives, they might be the ones to object or at least to try to stop any potential deal. Not Republicans and the reason he says he is so upset is because uh, he does not like the idea of that, that we've been talking about we've been reporting of keeping the tax cuts in place of income levels up to four hundred fifty thousand dollars he says he just believes that that's too high uh, of course the president as we know campaigned with a lot of democratic support on a threshold of two hundred fifty thousand dollars Harkin also said that he is not happy with the idea that Democrats are uh, talking about keeping the estate tax cut effectively cut in place which also expires tonight uh, and he's not happy with talk of patching the AMT, uh, which is effectively when the middle class gets, you know what, I'm going to actually toss back to you because M Mitch McConnell, we believe, is on the floor. He is the key negotiator on the Republican Party. All right. Thanks, Dana. Let's go to that. Uh, Mitch McConnell on the floor. You know, he has been sort of the closer on this, Mitch McConnell and, and, and Joe Biden. All right. I'm going to go back to you, Dana, because uh, he, he's not there quite yet. So let's talk. This is this is all in the in the hands of the Senate at this point. You were talking about Tom Harkin, um, you know, but the change CPI is something progressives hated. This idea of of Social Security changes being on the table, they won on that. Christine, I have to tell you, I'm having some audio problems, but I think you asked me about Social Security, uh, and so I'm just going to go with that. That was a big <laughs> issue, potential issue yesterday. It seems to have been resolved. Uh, Republicans, uh, we were told by Democrats, this was a clear tactic to tell us about this. Uh, Republicans had put that on the table, the idea of so-called, uh, it was called chain CPI, which would have an effect on Social Security recipients. Uh, the Republicans backed off on that after a meeting yesterday, so that doesn't seem to be on the table. But uh, forgive me, I, th I thought that Senator McConnell was going to be on the floor. We are expecting him momentarily. It was Senator Harkin, actually. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to just tell you about is that, Hark uh, is that McConnell and the Vice President have been in s intense negotiations uh, up until 12.45 in the morning and then again at 6.30 in the morning, and those negotiations are continuing, and that is why we are getting from both sides of the aisle, uh, despite some grumbling, major grumbling on uh, on the flanks of the left and the right, that uh, they are making progress. All right, Dana, I want to listen into a little bit of what uh, Tom Harkin, the veteran senator from Iowa, the progressive you were talking about, unhappy with parts of the negotiations. Let's listen to him for a minute. Fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year. That's the real middle class in America, and they're the ones that are getting hammered right now. You're getting hammered with housing costs, rental, heating bills, kids going to school, they have no retirement. Now they're talking about raising the retirement age when people work hard every day, stand on their feet, women standing on their feet every day for 30, 40 years, and raise the retirement age again on them. Well, I. <laughs> Again, if we're going to have some kind of a deal, the deal must be one that really does favor the middle class, the real middle class, those that are making thirty, fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year. That's the real middle class in America. And as I see this thing developing, uh, quite frankly, as I've said before, no deal is better than a bad deal, and this looks like a very bad deal the way this is shaping up. So I. I just want to make it clear, I, I'm all in favor of compromise. I've been here a long time, Mr. President. I've made a lot of compromises. I'm willing to make more compromises. Right, that's Tom Harkin, the uh, veteran 
Democratic senator from Iowa saying this deal doesn't look good to him. Uh, if a deal if a deal is reached in Congress, the president still has to sign it. President Obama set his terms and challenged the House and Senate to get it done. CNN White House correspondent Brianna Keeler joins me now. Brianna, is the president just sitting in the Oval Office waiting to get delivered, waiting for a bill to get delivered to him? Where, where is he in all of this right now? No, I mean, Vice President Biden is very much the president's proxy in all of this, and it's pretty easy to understand why. Uh, of course, both the president and vice president served in the Senate, but Biden served in the Senate for decades with all of the players that he now has to engage with. He knows the personalities. He knows the rhythms of the Senate and of Congress better than President Obama, you could argue. And so it, it makes sense that he's very much serving as the president's proxy. This is something the president is very engaged with. This is something the White House is obviously very engaged with. He said yesterday, Christine, he is optimistic that a deal uh, can be struck. I think that's not surprising. That's what you would expect to come from President Obama. But we're also, uh, you know, we've sort of said, oh, tonight is the deadline, and that's true because a lot of these um, tax cuts expire at midnight. But the sense, obviously, that we're getting from a lot of sources and from members of Congress is that perhaps tonight isn't a hard and fast deadline. The the. Mitch McConnell and the vice president, uh, president are negotiating in earnest to find a deal, but it's sort of difficult to see how exactly that may come to be by midnight and have votes in both the Senate and the House. Logistically, that would be very difficult, but the thought is that going over the cliff uh, gives cover for some Democrats and certainly some Republicans and that there will be a lot more pressure after the cliff comes to be in order to put a solution in place. So even after, if midnight were to come and go tonight, we would see them working still towards uh, an agreement we would expect. Politicking around a cliff that was always meant to be sort of the suicide pill so you would never be. <laughs> That's right. It's John Avalon, I keep quoting John Avalon. John Avalon, the Daily Beast uh, uh, columnist and CNN contributor, he said, Congress is racing to defuse a time bomb, a very dangerous time bomb, the Congress wired. The Congress set. <laughs> That's true. And the thing is, and we will continue to be in this process because now the expectation, yeah. obviously, is that dealing with the long term fiscal health, entitlement reform, tax reform, that will now get into the mix with the debt ceiling, which we're looking at February, March. So we'll be talking about these issues for still a long time to come here in the next couple months, Christine. For another metaphor, I think we're in the second inning of what will be a very long and painful process in this country of how to. Uh, how to, how to have a budget and how to stick to it. Thanks so much, Brianna White House correspondent, Brianna Keeler. Uh, coming up, we're going to take a closer look at the cliff and, and what failure to reach a deal could do to your paycheck and when. We'll also look at the hit that you're going to take even if they do reach a deal. Going right now, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is in the hospital. She's uh, there because doctors discovered she had a blood clot. It was found during a follow-up exam for the concussion Clinton suffered earlier this month when Secretary Clinton fell and hit her head. She was suffering from a virus and was dehydrated at that time. Doctors say they'll keep her in the hospital for at least 48 hours to monitor and treat her condition. After 80 years on the newsstand, Newsweek magazine is going all digital in the new year, which means you'll only be able to read it online from now on. In a sign of the times, the final issue bearing today's date has hashtag last print issue stamped across the cover. Newsweek's editor-in-chief says the growing use of tablet computers by readers combined with weakness in print advertising led to this decision. Ja, in wenigen Stunden ist es soweit, dann begrüßt Deutschland das Jahr 2013. Den ganzen Tag liefen die Vorbereitungen auf Hochtouren. An den Feinkosttheken und Supermarktkassen bildeten sich lange Schlangen. Und am Brandenburger Tor bereitet man sich auf die größte Party des Jahres vor. Über den Countdown zum Jahreswechsel und worauf Sie heute Nacht achten sollten, Gordian Fritz. Ein Hamburger Supermarkt vor zwei Stunden. Die Kunden quetschen sich durch volle Gänge. An der Kasse herrscht Hochbetrieb. Letzte Silvestereinkäufe werden hier im wahrsten Sinne des Wortes kofferweise weggebracht. Wein und Sekt. Und was Süßes. Nur kurz was zum Essen machen. Also für Karottensalat und eine Flasche Wein für heute Abend. Wir haben keinen Stress. Alles gut. Wir haben was Spaß dabei. Es ist nicht so schlimm. Es ist verrückt, aber es ist nicht so schlimm. Silvestervorbereitungen ganz anderer Art im sächsischen Görlitz. Feuerwerkssicherung für Fahrscheinautomaten. Für diesen kommt das leider zu spät. Unbekannte hatten ihn mit Böllern gesprengt. Heute um Mitternacht kommt dann das richtige Feuerwerk. Für ca. 115 Millionen Euro haben die deutschen Raketen eingekauft. 
Für alle, die es heute Abend mal wieder richtig krachen lassen wollen, noch der Tipp beim Feuerwerk, vor allem im Westen und Norden, aufpassen auf den teils Bögenwind. Für Sturmböen reicht es aber wahrscheinlich nur an der Nordsee. Ruhiger ist das Wetter nur im Süden Deutschlands, doch für die Krankenhäuser heißt es überall Extraschichten. In Leipzig wurden sogar mehr Betten aufgestellt und das Personal aufgestockt. Wir haben schon sehr viel mehr als sonst zu tun. Wir sind bereits jetzt 16 Uhr schon in der doppelten Anzahl der normalen Patienten. Die typische Verletzung ist ein in der Hand gehaltener Böller, der zu komplexen Handverletzungen führt. Des Weiteren sind Streifschüsse bzw. Verbrennungen zweitgradig, drittgradig. Heiß laufen werden um Mitternacht auch wieder die Telefonnetze. Geschätzte 320 Millionen Neujahrsgrüße allein per SMS. Viele werden wohl erst Stunden später ankommen. Aber kein Grund für schlechte Stimmung auf den Silvesterpartys. Die größte steigt natürlich wieder in Berlin. Zwei Kilometer lang ist die Partymeile. Eine Million Gäste werden erwartet. Jeder davon muss durch die Sicherheitskontrollen. Schon heute Nachmittag herrscht eine ausgelassene Stimmung. Super, super. Kann gar nicht besser sein. Kann nur besser werden. Ordentlich feiern. <lacht> wir werden erstmal schön reinfeiern und dann dauert das noch ein paar Stunden, ehe wir uns anfreunden mit 2013. Aber ob nun am Brandenburger Tor, Münchner Kneipe oder Gala-Dinner in Frankfurt, Punkt Mitternacht werden sich alle in den Armen liegen und sagen, frohes neues Jahr. Tja, und dort, wo Deutschlands größte Silvesterparty stattfindet, direkt vor dem Brandenburger Tor in Berlin, steht jetzt meine Kollegin Nicole Scherbert. Nicole, gibt es denn noch freie Plätze oder ist die Partymeile schon voll? Naja, Annette, voll noch nicht, aber schon richtig gut gefüllt. Denn wer hier auf Berlins größter Partymeile einen der besten Plätze ergattern will, der ist wirklich gut beraten, früh herzukommen. 12 Uhr Mittag hat die Partymeile bereits geöffnet und seitdem strömen die Menschen zur weltweit größten Silvester-Open-Air-Party hier direkt am Brandenburger Tor. 100.000 sind es mittlerweile und die fiebern vor allem dem gigantischen Höhenfeuerwerk entgegen, das hier gegen Mitternacht gezündet wird. Elf Minuten lang werden 6.000 Raketen in den Berliner Nachthimmel geschickt und wir sind mit unserem Team live dabei, werden kurz vor Mitternacht den Countdown mit den RTL-Zuschauern zusammen runterziehen. Ich denke, das sind Aussichten, auf die es sich ein paar Stündchen noch zu warten lohnt. Nicole Scherbert, vielen Dank nach Berlin und einen guten Rutsch Ihnen. Ja, während wir noch gut fünf Stunden auf das neue Jahr warten müssen, haben Millionen Menschen 2013 bereits begrüßt. Die ersten waren die Einwohner von Samoa, gefolgt von Neuseeland. Das größte Feuerwerk gab es aber wieder einmal im australischen Sydney. Carlo Schlender hat die schönsten Bilder zusammengestellt. 14 Uhr deutscher Zeit explodierte der Himmel über der berühmten Harbour Bridge in Sydney in einem Meer aus funkelnden Sternen. Kaskaden aus gleißendem Magnesium, verbrennenden Salzen und verglühenden Eisenspänen verzauberten die rund eineinhalb Millionen Menschen am Boden. Mit 700 Tonnen Feuerwerk und computergesteuerter Zündung erzeugten die Pyrotechniker durch Milliarden von aufblitzenden Lichtpunkten kurzlebige Gemälde an den Nachthimmel. Ganz anders in Japan. Hier begrüßten die Menschen das neue Jahr traditionell ruhig und besinnlich. Von allen buddhistischen Tempeln erklang ein Glockenspiel aus 108 verschiedenen Klängen. Mit jedem Klang soll eine der weltlichen Sünden vergessen werden, um unbelastet ins neue Jahr zu gehen. Zum ersten Mal erhellte in diesem Jahr auch in Nordkorea buntes Feuerwerk den Nachthimmel. Während die Menschen in dem bitterarmen Land oft nicht wissen, wie sie über die Runden kommen sollen, ließ es der neue Machthaber Kim Jong-un für die Elite des Landes mächtig krachen. Obwohl in China nach dem astronomischen Lunisolarkalender 2013 erst am 10. Februar beginnt, feiert man zumindest in der Konsummetropole auch den Jahreswechsel nach dem weltweit angewendeten gregorianischen Kalender mit einem beeindruckenden Feuerwerk, das die Skyline Hongkongs in ein gleißendes Gewand hüllte. Die USA steuern im Haushaltsstreit weiter ungebremst auf die sogenannte Fiskalklippe zu. Seit knapp drei Stunden verhandelt der Senat in Washington, um doch noch in letzter Sekunde eine Einigung zu erzielen. Beobachter räumen den Versuch jedoch kaum Chancen ein. Kommt es nicht zu einer Einigung zwischen Demokraten und Republikanern, dann treten zum Jahreswechsel automatisch Ausgabenkürzungen und Steuererhöhungen in Kraft, die die weltgrößte Volkswirtschaft in eine Rezession stürzen könnten. Das wiederum könnte Folgen für die gesamte Weltwirtschaft haben. 
Ja, und auch wir hier in Deutschland würden die Auswirkungen deutlich zu spüren bekommen. Und so warnt Bundeskanzlerin Merkel in ihrer Neujahrsansprache vor allem davor, dass das kommende Jahr nicht einfach wird. Bislang steht Deutschland wirtschaftlich noch glänzend da. Doch 2013 könnte das Wachstum einen deutlichen Dämpfer erhalten. Cordula Robeck und Thomas Berding berichten. Nochmal sauber machen im alten Jahr. Im Berliner Regierungsviertel wird kurz vor der Silvesterparty aufgeräumt. Und auch die Hausherrin im Kanzleramt will im Staatshaushalt Ordnung schaffen. Es soll weiter gespart werden. Das verspricht Merkel den Bürgern in ihrer Neujahrsansprache. Dennoch weiß ich, dass viele natürlich auch mit Sorgen in das neue Jahr gehen. Und tatsächlich wird das wirtschaftliche Umfeld nächstes Jahr nicht einfacher, sondern schwieriger. Denn die Eurokrise dämpft das Wirtschaftswachstum. Vor allem, weil die Krisenländer der Exportnation Deutschland nicht mehr so viel abkaufen. Experten rechnen zwar noch mit Wachstum, aber nicht mit viel. Höchstens ein Prozent im nächsten Jahr. Die Krise ist noch längst nicht überwunden. Und auch international muss noch mehr getan werden, um die Finanzmärkte besser zu überwachen. Die Welt hat die Lektion der verheerenden Finanzkrise von 2008 noch nicht ausreichend gelernt. An den Börsen sieht man das offenbar anders. Hier erwarten viele neue Höchststände im kommenden Jahr. Aber auch die deutschen Arbeitnehmer können 2013 mit etwas mehr Geld rechnen. Experten erwarten leichte Lohnerhöhungen. Gleichzeitig sollen die Preise nur um 1,5 Prozent und damit schwächer als bisher nach oben gehen. So werden die Deutschen einen großen Teil ihres Geldes auch weiter in den Konsum stecken. Das liegt eben an der sehr guten Arbeitsmarktlage. Das wird auch in den kommenden Jahren relativ gut bleiben und an der entsprechend äh, guten äh, Lohnentwicklung. Und auch den gut 20 Millionen Rentnern winkt 2013 eine zumindest leichte Rentensteigerung. Wie hoch die genau sein wird, will die Regierung im März sagen. Geteiltes Echo. SPD-Kanzlerkandidat Per Steinbrück bekommt zum Thema Kanzlergehalt Rückendeckung aus der eigenen Partei. SPD-Gesundheitsexperte Karl Lauterbach sagte, gemessen an der Größe des Landes verdiene die Kanzlerin in der Tat zu wenig. Grünen-Chefin Claudia Roth zeigte jedoch kein Verständnis, andere Themen seien wichtiger. Aus der FDP kamen Stimmen, Steinbrück gehe es offenbar nur ums Geld. Sorge um Hillary Clinton. Die US-Außenministerin ist wegen eines Blutgerinnsels im Kopf in ein New Yorker Krankenhaus eingeliefert worden. Dort muss sie wenigstens zwei Tage zur Beobachtung bleiben. Das Gerinnsel hatte sich nach einer zu spät erkannten Gehirnerschütterung vor ein paar Wochen gebildet. Deswegen seien auch weitere Folgeuntersuchungen notwendig, hieß es. In Washington läuft der Countdown im Haushaltsstreit. Stürzt die größte Wirtschaftsmacht wirklich über die sogenannte Fiskalklippe? Mit allen unberechenbaren Folgen weltweit. Noch wird gepokert im Kapitol. Vizepräsident Biden soll jetzt zwischen Demokraten und Republikanern vermitteln und bis Mitternacht einen Kompromiss schmieden, der automatische Steuererhöhungen und Ausgabenkürzungen verhindert. Über das Tauziehen in Washington, Ralf Golden. Es wird unter Hochdruck verhandelt im Kongress. Tag und Nacht arbeiten Demokraten und Republikaner an einer Einigung. Doch die Bürger verlieren langsam die Geduld. Sie lassen uns einfach hängen, ich habe es langsam satt. Es ist so, als ob du dich um deine Hypothek sorgen würdest, obwohl du längst obdachlos bist. Sie müssen ihren Job machen, aber sie kriegen es nicht hin. Noch gestern zeigte sich Präsident Obama optimistisch, doch noch rechtzeitig eine Lösung zu finden. Die Angebote, die ich den Republikanern gemacht habe, waren so fair, dass sogar schon einige Demokraten langsam sauer auf mich werden. Doch die Haushaltsklippe rückt näher und damit massive Steuererhöhungen für die Bürger. Viele Experten befürchten sogar eine Rezession mit Folgen für die Weltwirtschaft. Ich hoffe, dass wir das heute noch lösen können, um den Leuten endlich Sicherheit zu geben. Ich glaube nur, dass der Präsident nicht wirklich daran interessiert ist, eine Lösung zu finden, um das größte Problem unseres Landes zu klären. Vor zwei Stunden trat der Senat erneut zusammen. Einig ist man sich offenbar nur darin, dass Gutverdienende höher besteuert werden. Und für zwei Millionen Arbeitslose könnte es auch im Januar finanzielle Hilfen geben. Doch noch ist im Kongress nichts entschieden. Zu viele Streitpunkte, die noch offen sind. Zum ersten Mal seit vier Jahrzehnten tagt der Kongress an Silvester. Ralf Goldmann, wie sieht es im Moment aus? Ist eine Lösung in Sicht? 
Naja, so in den letzten 10, 15 Minuten äh, kommt doch etwas Bewegung in die zuletzt doch sehr festgefahrene Situation. Also die Zeichen mehren sich, dass es ja doch noch heute zu einer Einigung kommen kann. Und Präsident Obama hat auch für halb acht deutscher Zeit eine Stellungnahme angekündigt. Das Problem ist nur, dass eine gemeinsame Gesetzesvorlage noch nicht einmal im Senat, Senat verabschiedet worden ist. Und das ist Grundvoraussetzung dafür, dass später das Abgeordnetenhaus äh, mit seiner republikanischen Mehrheit tatsächlich äh, entscheiden kann. Es liegt jetzt offenbar daran, ob die automatischen Ausgabenkürzungen die automatisch halt in Kraft treten würden. Ob man die nicht um drei Monate einfach nach hinten verschieben kann, das wollen zumindest die Republikaner, die Demokraten sagen, ein Jahr nach hinten verschieben wäre noch besser. Also es gibt einige Zeichen, die stehen auf Einigung und es ist möglich, dass wir hier kurz vor Ende äh, dieses Jahres noch eine Lösung finden werden. Aber man muss auch bedenken, ein Scheitern ist auch immer noch im Bereich des Möglichen. Das waren Informationen direkt aus Washington von unserem Reporter Ralf Goldmann. Vielen Dank. Im US-Haushaltsstreit ringen Demokraten und Republikaner kurz vor Jahresende weiter um einen Kompromiss. Soeben hat sich Präsident Obama erneut an die Öffentlichkeit gewandt. Er sagte, eine Einigung sei in Sicht. Die Zeit drängt, denn sonst würden zum 1. Januar automatisch massive Ausgabenkürzungen sowie Steuererhöhungen für alle Haushalte in Kraft treten. Sie schwören den Treueeid auf ihre Fahne, doch mit vielen Volksvertretern ist offenbar kaum Staat zu machen. Diesen frustrierenden Eindruck äußern heute viele Amerikaner angesichts des nervenraubenden Hickhacks in Washington. Wutbürger im Fernsehen. Das ganze Schlamassel um die Fiskalklippe zeigt, wie lebensfremd ihr da in Washington seid, in eurer Traumwelt. Ihr wisst gar nicht mehr, wie wir Normalbürger leben in diesem Land. Ihr benehmt euch wie verwöhnte Gören, denen es wichtiger ist, Recht zu haben, als das Rechte zu tun und diejenigen zu vertreten, die euch gewählt haben. Amerikas Empörung zeigt ein wenig Wirkung in Washington. Es ist Bewegung in den Verhandlungen. Die Demokraten sind den Republikanern etwas entgegengekommen. Die umstrittene Steuererhöhung für die Reichen könnte nun erst ab einem Jahreseinkommen von 450.000 Dollar gelten, statt der von Barack Obama geforderten 250.000 Dollar. Das ist kein Durchbruch, aber wenigstens ein Signal der Hoffnung. Wir verhandeln weiter darüber, wie wir Amerikas Mittelschicht vor den morgen in Kraft tretenden Steuererhöhungen bewahren können. Aber wir sind in etlichen Punkten noch uneinig. Die Zeit läuft uns jetzt davon. An ihrem letzten Handelstag des Jahres ist die New Yorker Börse erstaunlich gelassen. Zur Stunde sind Dow Jones und Nasdaq sogar im Plus. Doch die Zitterpartie ist immer noch nicht zu Ende. Zum letzten Stand der Verhandlungen über den US-Haushalt jetzt unser Korrespondent Stefan Niemann live aus Washington. Ja, vor wenigen Minuten trat der gut gelaunte US-Präsident Barack Obama hier vor die Fernsehkameras und überraschte die Nation und uns Medienvertreter mit der Botschaft, dass ein Deal nun doch in greifbarer Nähe sei, dass es möglich sei, dass Demokraten und Republikaner sich doch noch einigten. Das sei alles noch nicht eingetütet und richtig äh, fest, aber es gebe deutliche Zeichen, dass es doch noch gelingen könnte, kurz vor Jahreswechsel zu verhindern, dass die Nation über die Fiskalkippe äh, rutscht und äh, dass dann viele Amerikaner höhere Steuern zahlen. Müssten. Ähm, dies muss aber jetzt vom Senat noch verabschiedet werden. Es bleiben nur knapp zehn Stunden für den Kongress, für beide Kammern, um der Nation die schlimmsten Folgen der Fiskalklippe zu ersparen. Das Bangen geht also weiter und die Amerikaner hoffen, dass sie eine Katerstimmung dann vielleicht doch eher vom Silvesterfeiern haben und nicht von dieser Haushaltskrise. Und damit zurück zu Jan Hofer. Während in Deutschland noch die Vorbereitungen für den Jahreswechsel laufen, hat 2013 in vielen Teilen der Erde schon begonnen. In Japans Hauptstadt Tokio ist das neue Jahr mit Glockenschlägen begrüßt worden. Die australische Metropole Sydney wurde von einem Feuerwerk erleuchtet, das zu den größten weltweit zählt. Es kostete umgerechnet rund 5,2 Millionen Euro. In Berlin sind die Besucher schon Stunden vor dem Jahreswechsel in bester Feierlaune. Eine Million Besucher, so die Prognose, werden bei der Silvesterparty am Brandenburger Tor vorbeigeschaut haben. Das Fest in der deutschen Hauptstadt wirkt offenbar wie ein Magnet, und zwar international. Natürlich ist in Rio an der Copacabana, da rennen mehr Menschen zum Strand, aber das ist wahllos. Und in New York ist ja ein Happening, eher, eher ein Zusammentreffen. Aber organisierte Partys sind wir mit Sicherheit, und das ist auch erwiesen, die weltgrößte Party. Geplant ist ein pralles Bühnenprogramm bis weit nach Mitternacht. Die Berliner Tourismusbranche darf sich freuen, die Stadt ist komplett ausgebucht. Wir haben uns für Berlin entschieden, weil es einfach das Beste ist, was wir heute tun können. 
Also man hört ja immer, dass hier in Berlin wirklich die größte Party stattfinden soll und wir wollen das einfach mal miterleben. Das ist einfach muss. Also wenn man jung ist, muss man das einfach mal machen. Einfach Spaß haben. Wir sind Brasilianer und studieren in Portugal, aber es war klar, wir müssen nach Berlin. Prost, ihr Deutschen. Die Temperaturen sind mild für eine Silvesternacht, für den, der die Kälte vermisst. Im Hotel Adlon gibt es eine Bar komplett aus Eis. Ein Promenade stehen geblieben. Wir haben jetzt einen Pegelstand von ungefähr 7,20 Meter, 7,25 Meter. Und das heißt, fast alle guten Plätze sind begehbar. Und die Temperaturen sind gar nicht schlecht. Die Gäste sitzen draußen, genießen 10 Grad ungefähr. Ist ein bisschen stürmisch geworden, aber wenn es wirklich trocken bleiben sollte heute Nacht, dann ist das eine ideale Silvesternacht. Und das städtische Ordnungsamt hat natürlich Vorkehrungen getroffen. Ralf Meyer erklärt welche. Wir sind natürlich auf einen riesen Zuschauerstrom vorbereitet, wie wir es auch aus den vergangenen Jahren kennen. Deshalb haben wir umfangreiche äh, Sperrungen für die Brücken vorgesehen. Wir empfehlen äh, von nah und fern, bitte mit der Bahn oder der KVB anreisen. Alle wollen den Blick auf den Dom haben, wenn das Feuerwerk losgeht und auf die Alte. Das ist wunderschön. Äh, aber genauso begehrt sind Plätze auf der Silverinsbrücke, der Hohenzollernbrücke äh, und natürlich auch am Rheinufer. Von da aus hat man eine sehr schöne Aussicht auf dieses Köln-Panorama mit Feuerwerk. Also das sind jetzt die Ratschläge für alle Kurzentschlossen. Es gibt aber tatsächlich auch Leute, die bereiten die Silvesternacht etwas besser vor. Und die haben sich Plätze bei der Personenschifffahrt gegönnt. Und dort liefen vor wenigen Minuten wirklich die letzten Vorbereitungen auf Hochtouren. Willkommen an Bord heißt es für viele Tausend, die sich die Plätze gesichert haben. Allerdings, eins muss man sagen, die Kapitäne, die sollten heute bestimmt auf ein Glas Sekt verzichten. Denn das mit der Durchfahrt unter den Brücken, das wird eine verdammt knappe Sache. Aber ich würde jetzt mal von der Deutzer Brücke allen Zuschauern sagen, einen guten Rutsch und ein schönes neues Jahr 2013. Dir auch, Martin. Ja, das wünsche ich dir natürlich auch. Danke, Jochen Hilgers. Und wir wünschen uns was für 2013. Vor allem logisch Glück. Das kommt ja angeblich unter anderem vom Schornsteinfeger und vom vierblättrigen Kleeblatt. Und man kann es kaufen, weshalb man konnte heute bei einem Kölner Blumenhändler, der hat nämlich diese Gestecke hier zusammengestellt. Glück und anderes, was mir zu diesem Jahreswechsel eingefallen ist, das gibt es heute auch bei uns im Blog aktuellestunde.de. Carsten Schwanke wird uns heute das Wetter aus Berlin vorhersagen, vom Brandenburger Tor, wo ab Mitternacht das größte Feuerwerk der Republik steigen wird. Carsten, haben wir denn wenigstens Glück mit dem Wetter? Das habe ich mir gedacht, Martin. Natürlich kommt von dir wieder eine äußerst komplizierte, ja geradezu schwierige Frage. Heikles Terrain. Bevor ich diese Frage beantworte, begebe ich mich erstmal auf sicheres Terrain und er sage, wie das Wetter hier für all diejenigen ist, die nach Berlin gefahren sind. Und ich habe es heute gesehen, hier am Hauptbahnhof in Berlin, die Züge, die aus Nordrhein-Westfalen hier ankamen, die waren brechend voll. Dort am Brandenburger Tor, dort wird auch heute wieder eine der größten Silvesterpartys der Welt stattfinden. Rund eine Million Menschen werden sich heute Abend hier versammeln und die haben Glück. Hier kann man auf jeden Fall trocken feiern bei milden 6 Grad. Aber nun natürlich zu deiner Frage und zur alles entscheidenden Frage. Für Sie zu Hause, meine Damen und Herren, wie wird denn nun die Silvesternacht in Nordrhein-Westfalen? Meine Antwort, sie wird zweigeteilt. Überall trockenes Wetter kann ich leider nicht versprechen. Die Grenze, auch der Regen kommt aus Nordwesten heute Nacht an und die Grenze wird etwa sein Aachen, Düsseldorf könnte mit Glück noch trocken bleiben und dann hinauf nach Münster. Alles nordwestlich davon, dort könnte es dann eben schon regnen. In allen anderen Gebieten hingegen bleibt es zumindest gegen Mitternacht noch trocken. Temperaturen dazu 6 bis 9 Grad. Ein Hinweis noch, es wird ziemlich windig sein. Passen Sie bitte auf beim Abfeuern der Raketen. Dann kommen wir zum Neujahrstag und morgen Vormittag haben wir überall stark bewölkten Himmel und auch Regen, der kräftiger sein wird in den Bergen. In der Eifel, Bergisches Land, Sauerland, Rothaargebirge. 
Zum Nachmittag hin zieht sich der Regen nach Osten und Südosten zurück. Das heißt, dann können am Niederrhein auch schon wieder die ersten Sonnenstrahlen rauskommen. Auch tagsüber wenig andere Temperaturen, plus 6 bis plus 9 Grad. Der Wind weht aus Südwest mit Stärke 3 bis 4. Schauen wir noch kurz auf die weiteren Aussichten. Der Mittwoch. Ein bisschen bewölkt, wenig Regen, 5 bis 8 Grad und auch danach geht es sogar noch milder weiter. Also wo bleibt der Winter? Diese Frage kann ich nicht beantworten. Mir bleibt zum Schluss nach diesen Aussichten, Martin, euch allen einen guten Rutsch zu wünschen und allen Zuschauern ein gesundes 2013 und damit zurück zu dir, Martin. Ja, vielen Dank, Carsten. Wünschen wir natürlich an dich und dein Team auch. Das war Carsten Schwanke aus Berlin vom Brandenburger Tor, wo heute Nacht wieder eine Menge los sein wird. Based on the statement from her doctors, is that uh, it did the the the, uh, the blood clot in her head did not result in a stroke or neurological damage they know Correct. that already that there is no stroke no mini stroke no neurological they can determine that right away right well, the clinical exam and the mri can very quickly determine if any brain tissue itself has been damaged and it says also to help dissolve this clot her medical team began treating the secretary with blood thinners aspirin is a blood thinner but there are other more sophisticated blood thinners right right in general presumably what would she be taking Uh, likely either heparin uh, and then often transition to Coumadin, although there's some more modern agents uh, directed at the, the thrombin part of the blood system. Now, she's Secretary of State of the United States. How would this impact her in the short term? Uh, in if the she short were your term, patient, for example. Right. She, it would not affect her, her function. Uh, and she then travel, sort of for executive. Example. She could travel. Uh, it really just affects uh, sort of heavy physical activity, but otherwise, once you're Medication is regulated appropriately. You can go about all the normal activities of daily living. Because some people have suggested to me, including our own Dr. Sanjay Gupta, who's a neurosurgeon, that if you have a concussion, you shouldn't be working that hard. You should let the brain sort of rest. And one thing you shouldn't do is testify before the House or the Senate on Benghazi. Well, I'd certainly uh, defer to your, your uh, to Dr. Gupta, who's a neurosurgical expert on, the, on an issue like that. I like an expert on a concuss concussion. Exactly. And when they say her doctors, uh, uh, she will be released once the medication dose has been established. What does that mean? Well, uh, in the instance of uh, Coumadin, uh, uh, we, you give the medicine and then you check certain coagulation parameters in the blood. And the dosage uh, differs very widely for different people. So it has to be tailored and the dose adjusted over a period of days and weeks to find out what the exact and correct dosage is for that patient. And we're, uh, the other good part of the statement, and I'll read it to our viewers, in all other aspects of her recovery, the secretary is making excellent progress, and we are confident she will make a full recovery. She is in good spirits, engaging with her doctors, her family, and her staff. That's a statement coming from her two doctors. And so all of that would indicate that she didn't have any clinical change, and that's also reflected in how this was discovered. It's very different when it's discovered as a result of clinical symptoms versus an imaging test that shows something without any clinical symptoms. And if you've had a history of deep vein thrombosis, blood clot in the, behind the knee, for example, and now in the head, you just got to be careful down the road, right? Correct. I mean, there's some proclivity for venous thrombosis um, that has either been defined or, or undefined. So she's certainly at higher risk just because of that history or prior deep vein thrombosis. Dr. Deaton, you've been a big help uh, to us and to all Absolutely. of our viewers watching. Thank you so much for coming in. Absolutely. We'll take Thank a quick you. break. We'll continue. And you're in the Situation Room. Happening now, two breaking news stories we're following. The Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, is hospitalized with a potentially serious blood clot in her head. Doctors have just revealed the location. Also, America is just hours away from a massive tax hike and spending cuts uh, heading over the dreaded fiscal cliff. President Obama says an agreement, though, is within sight. Republican-led House of Representatives, though, will now wait until after the country goes over that fiscal cliff at midnight tonight before coming up with a deal, if, in fact, there is a deal. We want to welcome our viewers in the United States and around the world. I'm Wolf Blitzer. You're in the Situation Room. This is CNN Breaking News. Let's get to the first uh, breaking news story we're following right now. The Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is in the hospital this New Year's Eve with a potentially serious blood clot, which doctors have now revealed is located between her brain and her skull. Let's go straight to CNN's uh, foreign affairs correspondent, Jill Doherty, for the latest. Jill, uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta is going to join us momentarily as well. But tell us what her doctors have just revealed. Well, Wolf, um, backing up just a little bit, all day today, the question was, where was that blood clot? Because after all, 
In the statement that came out initially, there was no indication of exactly where it was located. We knew that she had a blood clot as a result of uh, the concussion that she suffered when she had the flu. So now, uh, just a few minutes ago, the doctors who treat Secretary Clinton uh, issued a statement, a very technical statement, defining precisely where that is located. And I'll leave it, of course, to uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta to explain precisely, but essentially it is a clot in the vein that is located between the skull and the brain behind the right ear. And uh, the significance of that is, of course, it's not what people were thinking, which might be something, let's say, deep vein thrombosis in her leg, something she's suffered from or, or suffered previously in 1998. But they are also saying that other than that, uh, she is making excellent progress and should make a full recovery. So what they're doing right now, Wolf, is they are looking at and, and treating the secretary with blood thinners, but they point out, she won't be released until they figure out exactly the dose that she needs. So this is significant, of course, for the secretary's schedule. Uh, she was going to be coming back this week, everyone thought, looking forward to it, uh, ready pretty soon to testify on Benghazi and many other things. Uh, but now it looks as if this could take a, a while longer. Uh, certainly does. All right, uh, Jill, stand by. I want to bring in our own Dr. Sanjay Gupta, our chief medical correspondent himself, a neurosurgeon who knows a lot about blood clots in the head. Uh, Sanjay, uh, uh, I want to read the full statement that our two doctors just released, and then you and I will discuss what we have learned. This is the statement from our doctors, Dr. Lisa uh, Berdak and Dr. Gigi Elbayumi. In the course of a routine follow-up MRI on Sunday, the scan revealed that a right transverse sinus venous thrombosis had formed. This is a clot in the vein that is situated in the space between the brain and the skull behind the right ear. It did not result in a stroke or neurological damage. To help dissolve this clot, her medical team began treating the secretary with blood thinners. She will be released once the medication dose has been established. In all other aspects of her recovery, the secretary is making excellent progress and we are confident she will make a full recovery. She is in good spirits, engaging with her doctors, her family, and her staff. All right, Sanjay, uh, when you he heard the whole statement, walk us through what went through your mind. Oh, well. Uh, I think I've just lost uh, Dr. Gupta. Uh, we're going to try to reestablish our connection with him. Uh, uh, Dr. Gupta uh, is learning about all of this just as we're learning about it. And uh, just to recap, right now, the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton is at New York, in a, in a New York hospital. She's recovering not only from a blood clot that was discovered uh, as a result of her routine follow-up MRA on, on Sunday, but she uh, had originally gotten very, very ill as a result of a severe case of the flu that she had. She became dehydrated. She fainted at one point, and she fell on her head, we are told, and that resulted in a concussion. And that's why she's been out of commission over these past few weeks, uh, didn't testify before the House or the Senate on the Benghazi report. But now uh, we've just learned uh, as a result of this MRI on Sunday that she does have a blood clot in the vein that is situated in the space between her brain and the skull, and it's right behind the right ear. Uh, so we're, we're hoping, obviously, she makes a full recovery as her doctors are expressing confidence that she will. We'll connect with Sanjay, and we'll get his analysis of what's going on. Uh, but in the meantime, there's another breaking news story we're following right now, including that so-called fiscal cliff. Only seven hours until the ball drops for New Year's, uh, and seven hours until the United States formally goes over that fiscal cliff. A still combative, President Obama says, an agreement is in sight, and the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, says it's very, very close as well. But House Republicans have decided they will not vote until after taxes have already gone up. They're supposed to go up uh, after midnight. We have complete coverage of this breaking news story for you as well. Let's begin this hour with our senior congressional correspondent, Dana Bash. So, Dana, as we've been saying, we are going over the fiscal cliff. Technically, that is true, and the House has decided that uh, there's no point from the perspective of Republicans who run the House uh, to stay tonight because 
the plan over the past two, three days has been for the Senate, which is down the hall behind me, to vote on any kind of deal first and then send it to the House. Well, the Senate isn't even there yet. They're very close, very, very close, but close doesn't give a bill uh, to, the, to the people who need to write it and put it on the floor for votes. So that's the reason uh, why House Republicans decided that they would just let their members know on New Year's Eve that it's okay to go home and that they hope, they say, that they will vote tomorrow. Yes, technically, there's no question we are going over the cliff, uh, but it's important to, to underscore the fact that tomorrow is a federal holiday. And, uh, and so that means that the markets aren't going to be open to be spooked, which is a big concern here in Congress. And more importantly, they're still hoping that tomorrow they can take the vote that will put things, in, put things in the way they want it, you know, seal the deal. Uh, the other political subplot to this, which I think is also very interesting, and we've been reporting on this for a, a few days, is that when the U.S. does go off the fiscal cliff and everybody's taxes go up, politically and technically, what everybody can say that they voted on are tax cuts, because the taxes are already up, as opposed to vo voting on tax increases. So it's a lot more politically palatable, easier to explain to constituents, and more importantly, perhaps, their political rivals. Now, one last thing before I go back to you, Wolf, I should tell you, I pointed to the Senate. That's down here behind me. Right on the other side of the rotunda, Senate Republicans are meeting as we speak. And they're getting an update from Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell, who, of course, has been the chief negotiator uh, on talks with, uh, with the vice president. We were told going into this meeting that there wasn't a deal, that they were just getting an update, but perhaps we'll have more of a sense of whether the Senate even thinks that they can vote tonight. Uh, Mitch McConnell wanted to just get everything done that they agreed to, but uh, so far the Democrats who run the Senate are saying, not yet. Well, if it's politically more palatable, Dana, for the House Republicans to vote on it tomorrow, uh, as opposed to today, why not, why not the Senate Republicans? Why don't they wait till tomorrow as well? It's a great point. Uh, it's something that we have been talking about internally in the hours and hours and hours that we've been spending walking in the halls and, and standing and waiting to see uh, what will happen, that that is certainly a potential uh, political reason to, to wait. Uh, it doesn't seem as though that really is what's driving the Senate Republicans. It's more of an issue of, I'm told by Republican sources in the, in the House, maybe just a handful uh, of Republicans who could be swayed to vote for it, where otherwise they wouldn't have been able to do it. Dana, stand by. We're going to continue to watch this story. I'm anxious to see what the Senate, the Democratic leadership, the Republican leadership decides to do. Will there be a vote on the floor of the United States Senate in the coming hours or not? A deal or no deal? Stand by. Lots at stake. Uh, what does it mean, though, uh, if the U.S. goes over the fiscal cliff? Technically, the U.S. already going over the fiscal cliff because the House is adjourning. Tom Foreman is joining us now with more details. Uh, what are you seeing, Tom? What does it mean? You know, Wolf, even if you don't care about politics, you don't care about the president, you care about the parties or Congress or anything else, you should be watching this number back here right now. Because if this gets to zero without a deal, every taxpayer in America is going to be affected, or at least we're going to be one giant step closer to them being affected, because taxes will go up for everyone. By how much? Let's look at some examples here. Let's say that you make $50,000 a year. That's the median income in this country. I'm talking about for a couple, for a family. It's a little bit different with individuals, but still pretty close. If you make $50,000 a year, your taxes are going to go up by $2,000 next year and every year after that, unless this thing is fixed somehow. That's a whopping amount of money for people making that little, and that's what is in place if this goes that direction. What about if you make more than that? Let's say that you make $75,000 a year. That's a pretty good bit more. But if you make $75,000 a year, you're going to pay an additional $3,500 in taxes next year and every year after that, unless something is done about that. So another big increase there for a couple. And now let's look at $250,000. This is the amount the president's been talking about a whole lot. $250,000 a year. Your taxes will go up by eight thousand dollars next year if a deal is not struck now currently with the numbers we're talking about wolf if they can make this deal where the cutoff for all of this happening is four hundred and fifty thousand dollars then none of this happens all of these people would keep the current 
Bush era tax cuts, they would not see these increases. The increases would only kick in for people who are making more than $450,000 as a couple or more than $400,000 in an individual. They would return to the Clinton era tax rates of 39.5% versus 35% right now. But that's only if there's a deal. If there is not a deal, this is what's waiting for virtually all of us out there, which is a whole lot more taxes than we currently pay. And I do want to point one more thing out here, Wolf. Already in the coming year, you're probably going to see your taxes go up a little bit because this past year we've all enjoyed a, a relief from payroll taxes. Those have been reduced a little bit. There's no real sign that that's going to continue. There's going to be a little bump up so that if you make, say, $30,000 a year, you'll pay maybe $50 more per month. If you made $120,000 a year, you might pay close to $200 more a month. You may not see that so much because it'll just vanish in your check. But nonetheless, that's already coming. It's all the rest of this that is at stake. And that's why I say whether you care about politics or not, keep watching that number because that number is tied directly to your wallet, Wolf. It certainly is. Uh, all right, Tom, good explanation. Thank you. This year at NASA. In 2012, NASA continued to implement America's ambitious space exploration program, carrying out the first ever commercial mission to the International Space Station, advancing the systems needed to send humans deeper into space, and landing the most sophisticated rover on the surface of Mars. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Following a daring plunge through the Martian atmosphere billed as seven minutes of terror, the Mars Science Laboratory's Curiosity Rover made a successful on-target landing on the red planet in Gale Crater. It's a huge day for, for the nation. It's a huge day for all of our partners that have something on, you know, on Curiosity. And it's a huge day for the American people. For us, being able to land something in larger and larger measures with this capability will come the ability to land humans. Many new technologies had to work in perfect succession and perfect synchronization for this to happen. Hi, I'm Bob Ekfredosi of the Mars Science Laboratory team here at JPL. I'm at the Control Center for Curiosity where we command the rover and track data from Mars. And you're watching This Year at NASA. Curiosity has checked out the 10 science instruments it'll use on its two-year prime mission to search for signs of microbial life on Mars. And announcements in 2012 indicate more exploration of Mars is in NASA's future. NASA has selected a new mission set to launch in 2016 that will take the first look into the deep interior of Mars to see why the red planet evolved so differently from Earth as one of the solar system's rocky planets. The InSight mission will place instruments on the Martian surface to investigate whether the core of Mars is solid or liquid like Earth's. Understanding the, the interior structure, the interior processes and history of Mars is, is really fundamental to understanding the history and, and the formation of the solar system and of our, of our, of our own planet as well. Science news from the American Geophysical Union's 2012 fall meeting in San Francisco was headlined by NASA's announcement of a new robust multi-year Mars program that will feature a new Red Planet rover set to launch in 2020. While 2020 may seem a long way off, it's really not. You know, Curiosity was about a decade in the works. We have a tremendous amount of uh, systems engineering and even spare parts left from the MSL chassis. And that, those are really the enabling things. Uh, that allow us to do this. The 2020 mission will gather new science data about Mars and serve as the next step towards meeting President Obama's goal of sending humans to Mars in the 2030s. And launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. NASA helped make historic advances in commercial spaceflight in 2012. Space Exploration Technologies, one of two American companies participating in the agency's Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Program to supply the International Space Station, first completed a demonstration test flight to the ISS in May. 
Houston Station looks like we got us a dragon by the tail. Second stage capture is complete. I just want to take a moment to congratulate all of you on a superb effort today. Um, I think you know it, but you made history today and have firmly locked the future direction of American space program in place. Then in October, SpaceX and NASA teamed up for a space flight first. In a historic moment for the nation, SpaceX successfully launched its Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon cargo craft from Florida's Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on the first ever contracted cargo resupply flight to the International Space Station. The CRS-1 mission, the first of 12 such flights under NASA's Commercial Resupply Services contract, also marks the return of America's capability to independently resupply the orbiting laboratory. Capture complete. Looks like we've tamed the dragon. We're happy she's on board with us. SpaceX starts a whole uh, generation of commercial spacecraft coming up here for resupply. And one of the most interesting and unique aspects of this vehicle and its follow on will be that it can bring stuff back to Earth. And that's really important for the advancement of space flight. The Freedom Star, once used to recover shuttle rocket boosters, is now outfitted as a floating high-tech radar and camera platform. Inside a huge metal clamshell is a mobile optical system on a gyroscope-like tracking mount. During launch, the system will be focused skyward to take images of the SpaceX Falcon rocket and its Dragon capsule as far as 200 miles away. It's like standing and looking through a soda straw and, and trying to capture and see a bird flying through that soda straw. Then imagine that soda straw bobbing on a boat off the northeastern coast of the U.S. and seas that could swell up to 20 feet. Another company, Orbital, progressed towards its demo flight to the ISS targeted for the upcoming year. Another important milestone in NASA's partnership with industry to deliver cargo to the International Space Station has been reached at the Wallops Flight Facility. A test version of Orbital Sciences Corporation's Antares rocket rolled out to the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport's Launch Pad 0A. Antares will carry Orbital's Cygnus cargo module to the ISS. I'm Nils Larson, Chief Pilot at NASA's Dryden Flight Research Center, and today we're chasing Sophia's return to flight. And you're watching this here at NASA. NASA also took the next steps in the effort to launch Americans from U.S. soil once more, announcing new Space Act agreements in August with three American companies to design and develop the next generation of U.S. human spaceflight capabilities to low Earth orbit. These companies are Sierra Nevada Corporation, Space Exploration Technologies, and the Boeing Company. It is a capability that includes the spacecraft, the launch vehicle, the ground operations, as well as the flight operations. It's an entire mission cycle and doing the design work for that entire mission cycle. So we call it CCICAP for short. Operations software for the Crew Space Transportation or CST-100 spacecraft under development by Boeing has undergone its preliminary design review. The CST-100, a capsule-shaped reusable spacecraft, will carry up to seven people or a combination of people and cargo to the International Space Station and elsewhere in low Earth orbit. United Launch Alliance has reached the final milestone in its development of a commercial spacecraft for transporting astronauts to low Earth orbit. Technical experts from ULA and NASA completed their assessment of whether ULA's Atlas V rocket launch hardware would keep the crew safe during launch and ascent. Two of three newly funded NASA commercial crew partners, Boeing and Sierra Nevada, will use the Atlas V as their launch vehicle. And the Sierra Nevada Corporation's Dream Chaser spacecraft has passed a new milestone of its own. A test called a captive carry was performed successfully at Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport in Colorado. This test, used to validate ground and flight operations and flight characteristics of the Dream Chaser, employed an engineering test article and a sky crane helicopter. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Kevin Ford, commander of the Expedition 34 crew aboard the International Space Station. 
We've celebrated more than a dozen years of permanent human presence in this amazing out-of-this-world laboratory and are wrapping up an incredible year of achievement here on orbit. I would like to say to all of our viewers, you're watching This Year at NASA. In 2012, NASA and its international partners celebrated 12 years of permanent human habitation on the International Space Station. No fewer than a dozen new inhabitants spent up to six plus months aboard the world's only laboratory in microgravity and conducting research to benefit all on Earth and help prepare future generations of explorers to safely travel farther into space than any human has before. The ball is out. Is out. Expedition 32 flight engineers Sonny Williams of NASA and Aki Hoshidi of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency completed the installation of a spare main bus switching unit, or MBSU, to the truss of the International Space Station during a six-hour, 28-minute spacewalk. Problems installing the spare unit during an initial spacewalk on August 30th necessitated the crew fabricate tools with which they could complete their task on this latest EVA. The Glenn Research Center recently hosted media representatives at its space power facility. There, inside the clean room high bay facility, a new communications test bed that'll fly on the International Space Station was going through its checkout. The Space Communications and Navigation, or SCAN, test bed will be the first space hardware for exploring the promise of software-defined radio technology. The interesting part of this scan testbed are its three software-defined radios. These are radios that can be completely reconfigured on orbit by software. That means new operating environments, new applications that will change the characteristics of how it, it communicates. An unpiloted Russian resupply ship loaded with almost three tons of food, fuel, and supplies linked up to the International Space Station just six hours after its launch from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The technique could be used to similarly shorten a Soyuz vehicle's route to the station, thereby improving crew comfort as well as extending the life of the return vehicle while docked to the ISS. Astronaut Scott Kelly has been selected by NASA to begin a one-year mission aboard the International Space Station in 2015. Joining Kelly on the ISS will be Russian cosmonaut Mikhail Konyenko. The pair will launch aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan in spring 2015. Their 12-month stay aboard the world's only laboratory in microgravity will provide new data about how the human body reacts and adapts to the harsh environment of space. Hi, I'm TJ Creamer, one of the NASA astronauts privileged to serve aboard your International Space Station during Expeditions 22 and 23. I'm also a Payload Operations Director serving here at the Payload Operations Integration Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, managing science onboard Space Station 24 by 7. And you are watching This Year at NASA. This year at NASA saw steady progress made in the development of Orion, the agency's new spacecraft, and the Space Launch System, NASA's next generation heavy lift rocket. Today, NASA and Kennedy Space Center are again lifting our sights and lifting our spirit to new heights. The first Orion spacecraft destined for orbit arrived at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida to begin processing for a flight test in 2014. The flight test, called Exploration Flight Test 1, or EFT-1, will not carry any people into space during the mission. Instead, it will be loaded with a wide variety of instruments to evaluate how it behaves during launch, in the vacuum of space, and through the searing heat of re-entry. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to Mars. We know that the Orion capsule is a critical part of the system that is going to take us there. And so we're working on it. NASA engineers at the Stennis Space Center have set a new test record for the J2X power pack. The 1,350-second test on the A1 test stand broke the previous record of 1,150 seconds set earlier this summer. Three, two, one, release. 
The team of engineers working on development of the Orion multi-purpose crew vehicle and its components conducted the first vertical drop test of the 18,000-pound capsule at Langley Research Center's Hydro Impact Basin. Swing drop testing, during which Orion entered the water at an angle, was conducted last summer to certify it for water landings. Changing the angle of the drop test to vertical will help NASA more accurately predict Orion's landing loads. The landmark Vehicle Assembly Building at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida is getting a renovation so it can remain a fixture of America's space program. The VAB needs improvement on a grand scale to service new launchers expected to debut in the next few years. The new designs include the Space Launch System, a massive rocket intended to return astronauts to deep space. The building also will be set up to host commercial rockets that are much smaller. The massive aluminum adapter rings being built by engineers at the Marshall Space Flight Center will be used to connect Orion to the Delta IV rocket used to power the EFT-1 flight. But the same design will also be used on Space Launch System flights. The adapter rings are being designed once for both applications as part of NASA's aggressive pursuit of affordable solutions for the human exploration of space. The Michoud Assembly Facility played host to SLS Industry Day to help suppliers and other businesses better acquaint themselves with NASA's acquisition strategies. More than 90 companies and 40 government entities explored partnership opportunities with the Space Launch System Program. Hi, I'm Roy Malone, director of the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center Mishu Assembly Facility in New Orleans, Louisiana. Please pardon our dust as we prepare the facility to manufacture large components of the new SLS rocket. You're watching This Year at NASA. 2012 was a remarkable year for NASA science. Observations of other celestial bodies, as well as Earth, yielded new and valuable insight to help us better understand the origins of the universe and our home planet. Using NASA's Hubble Space Telescope, astronomers have seen further back in time than ever before. In the ambitious Hubble survey of a patch of sky known as the Ultra Deep Field, or UDF, uncovered a previously unseen population of seven primitive galaxies that formed more than 13 billion years ago, when the universe was less than 3% of its present age. The deepest images to date from Hubble yield the first statistically robust sample of galaxies that tells how abundant they were close to the era when galaxies first formed. Lines of Scientists with NASA's Messenger water, mission right? say new observations made by the spacecraft confirm a long-held theory that the polar regions of Mercury harbor an abundance of water ice and other frozen volatiles. Messenger which stands for Mercury Surface Space Environment Geochemistry and Ranging, is the first spacecraft to orbit the solar system's innermost planet. Astronomers have found an extraordinary galaxy cluster, one of the largest objects in the universe that is breaking several important cosmic records. Observations of the Phoenix Cluster, located about 5.7 billion light years from Earth, with NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, the National Science Foundation's South Pole Telescope and eight other world-class observatories may force astronomers to rethink how these colossal structures and the galaxies that inhabit them evolve. NASA's Kepler mission has wowed again. The spacecraft that stares at and detects changes in the light from a select group of stars has discovered 11 new planetary systems hosting a total of 26 confirmed planets. These discoveries nearly double the number of verified planets and triple the number of stars known to have more than one planet that transits or passes in front of the star. Such systems will help astronomers better understand how planets form. It wasn't something you see every day. The HU-25C Guardian, which had been at a Coast Guard base in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, was about to join NASA Langley's fleet in Hampton, Virginia, for its first NASA airborne mission, doing atmospheric research. 
So this is a big step forward in tech capability and power, range, altitude, speed, and weight that we can carry that we could not carry before. The Guardian's first NASA mission is scheduled for Greenland. Scientists say the extent of the sea ice covering the Arctic Ocean has shrunk. Researchers from NASA and the NASA-supported National Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado, say the amount of Arctic ice is the smallest observed in the three decades since consistent satellite observations of the polar cap began. The thickness of the sea ice cover also continues to decrease. New findings by NASA's Interstellar Boundary Explorer, or IBEX spacecraft, are helping scientists fill holes in our knowledge about the matter found between the stars in our Milky Way galaxy. IBEX, whose primary focus has been the interaction between our solar system and what lies beyond, has directly sampled multiple heavy elements within the interstellar medium, the same materials of which stars, planets, even people are made. NASA's Radiation Belt Space Probe's mission, RBSP, has been renamed. The National Aeronautics and Space Administration is pleased to announce the decision to rename the Radiation Belt Storm Probe's mission, Van Allen Probes. The new name announced during an event at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory is for James Van Allen, the scientist who discovered the radiation belt surrounding the Earth. Launched on August 30th and managed by the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, the newly renamed twin probes continue to follow each other in the same orbit around the planet. The data they return about how the Van Allen belts behave during solar storms will help scientists and engineers design more robust satellites and safer spacecraft, as well as stronger safeguards for communication systems and other critical technologies here on Earth. The mission of NASA's moon-orbiting GRAIL probes comes to an end on December 17th, with the twin spacecraft deorbiting to the lunar surface. The probes ebb and flow have generated a map of the moon's gravity field said to be the highest resolution of any celestial body. The map and other GRAIL data are enlightening scientists about the moon's internal structure and composition, and how Earth and other rocky planets in the solar system formed and evolved. The Goddard Space Flight Center recently took delivery of the first two of 18 beryllium primary mirror segments for NASA's James Webb Space Telescope. Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado shipped the two mirrors in custom containers. The remaining 16 mirrors will likewise make their way from Boulder to Goddard over the next 12 months and will be integrated into the telescope in 2015. The Webb, NASA's next great observatory, is on track for launch in October 2018. The museum in Washington, D.C. served as the site of a joint news conference by NASA and the U.S. Geological Survey to highlight 40 years' worth of accomplishments by Landsat, the world's longest-running Earth-observing satellite program. No other satellite program in our country or in any other nation in the world comes close to having the historical length and breadth and the continuity and the coverage of the Landsat archive. I'm Tanya Anderson at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, where we bring the stars down to Earth. Every day, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope photographs the wonders of the universe. These wonders inspire the next generation of explorers. You're watching This Year at NASA. With a new set of space technology roadmaps as a guide, NASA's Office of the Chief Technologist and the Space Technology Program continue to make great strides in creating the new knowledge and capabilities needed for NASA's current and future missions. A large inflatable heat shield developed by NASA's Space Technology Program at Langley Research Center has successfully survived a trip through Earth's atmosphere while traveling at hypersonic speeds up to 7,600 miles per hour. IRV-3, the inflatable re-entry vehicle experiment, was launched by sounding rocket from and NASA's Wallops Flight of Facility, inflated as expected to a mushroom shape almost 10 feet in diameter, returned safely through Earth's atmosphere at hypersonic speeds 
and fell into the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of North Carolina. The test demonstrated that a space capsule can use an inflatable outer shell to slow and protect itself during planetary entry and descent. Deputy Administrator Lori Garver joined Glenn Research Center Director Ray Lugo, congressional leaders, and White House representatives at Ohio's Cuyahoga Community College near Cleveland for a workshop on building the national network for manufacturing innovation. Advanced manufacturing capabilities are essential to turning research discoveries, inventions, and new ideas into better or novel products. Our nation's ability to innovate is unmatched. NASA Chief Technologist Mason Peck joined state and local officials at the University of Texas at El Paso for the official opening of UTEP's Center for Space Exploration Technology Research, or CSTER, and the NASA Science, Engineering, Mathematics, and Aerospace Education Laboratory, located in the university's engineering building. It's the kind of collaborative activity that we uh, now at NASA uh, recognize as essential to how we are trying to uh, form the future of space technology at the agency. NASA and the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition of Pensacola have jointly developed a robotic exoskeleton called X-1. The 57-pound device is a robot that a human can put on to assist or inhibit movement in leg joints. In space, it could be set to supply resistance for exercising. On the ground, it could help someone walk for the first time. Deputy Administrator Lori Garver opened NASA's Sample Return Robot Centennial Challenge at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Worcester, Massachusetts. These technologies don't build themselves. These rockets don't build themselves. It's all about people. It is the people throughout the agency and our contractor community and our academic partners who help us create the future. More than 600 people attended NASA Technology Days at Cleveland's Public Auditorium in Ohio. Associate Administrator Robert Lightfoot joined other NASA officials and the city's mayor at the three-day event. Technology demonstrations, informative speeches, and poster sessions celebrated cutting-edge research and technology development available to industry and universities. NASA Deputy Administrator Lori Garver visited the NASA Shared Services Center at Stennis Space Center. The NSSC provides support to NASA in the areas of human resources, financial management, procurement, information technology, and business support services. Garver was briefed by senior leadership on the latest NSSC initiatives, including the now fully operational Enterprise Service Desk that supports employees agency-wide. Small regional companies and government agencies near the Michoud Assembly Facility that may want to help develop and support the SLS were hosted at Contact 2012. 73 companies exhibited their services at the networking event co-sponsored by NASA, the Louisiana Small Business Administration, and Jacobs Technology. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden and Small Business Programs Associate Administrator Glenn Delgado, seen here on the far right, presented the annual Small Business Administrator's Cup Award to Stennis Space Center in recognition of its stellar small business program. The award recognizes successful and innovative practices promoting small business participation in NASA initiatives. Hi, I'm Gary Benton, and we're at the A1 test stand at NASA's Dennis Space Center, where we're testing J2X engine components for NASA's Space Launch System rocket, which will provide human exploration beyond Earth's orbit. You're watching this year at NASA. In 2012, NASA and educators continued stressing to students how science, technology, engineering, and math can not only lead to successful careers in America's space program, but also can be fun. Like this, NASA teamed up with Vanderbilt University's Dyer Observatory in Brentwood, Tennessee, to host a Summer of Innovation event for rising fifth and sixth graders from the Nashville area. 
The students enjoyed hands-on Mars-related activities and got to speak with NASA Associate Administrator for Education and former astronaut Leland Melvin. Summer of Innovation aims to inspire and engage middle school students in science, technology, engineering, and math, the STEM fields. This is the second year Dyer Observatory has partnered with NASA for Summer of Innovation. The MoonCam camera aboard Ebb, one of NASA's Twin Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory, or GRAIL spacecraft, has returned its first unique view of the far side of the lunar surface. MoonCam, for moon knowledge acquired by middle school students, will be used by students nationwide to study lunar images. America's Space Agency has crowned its vehicular engineering victors for the 19th annual NASA Great Moon Buggy Race at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville, Alabama. The winning teams outraced more than 80 teams from 20 states, Puerto Rico, Canada, Germany, India, Italy, Russia, and the United Arab Emirates. Organized by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, the race challenges students to design, build, and race lightweight human-powered buggies. Two groups girls and uh, underserved school district. Thanks to the enterprising efforts of a Bay Area High School student, she and 50 of her fellow students at their all-girls school heard from experts about STEM field careers women can pursue at NASA. Deepika Bhattapati, a high school senior at Presentation High School in San Jose, had written the White House about the disparity of opportunities for girls interested in pursuing careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. After her note made its way to the Ames Research Center, seven scientists, administrators, and managers, all of them women, volunteered to meet with the students and share stories about their careers, education, and keys to success. About 150 students from 18 schools in Mississippi and Louisiana got an inside look at the Stennis Space Center during a Women's History Month event. The outing was part of the GEMS program, for girls excited about math and science. The students were treated to activities and workshops, including a fashion show that featured business attire, an introduction to information technology, a cryogenics demonstration, and details about college and career planning. Educators from across the country visited Johnson Space Center to fly experiments in microgravity. During the flights, a modified aircraft flew parabolic arcs that simulate weightlessness. The opportunity was provided by three NASA education initiatives designed to spark interest in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM. Hello from the base of the world's longest microgravity drop tower. I'm Nancy Rebel Hall, a research scientist at the Glenn Research Center here in the Zero Gravity Research Facility, where we continue to unlock the mysteries of microgravity. You're watching This Year at NASA. In 2012, NASA Aero continued its world leadership in the pursuit of the fastest, safest, most quiet, and fuel-efficient aircraft possible. Researchers from Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo, California, recently tested a future aircraft concept model called Amelia, the advanced model for extreme lift and improved aeroacoustics. The 111th scale model with a 10-foot wingspan was tested in the National Full Scale Aerodynamic Complex at the Ames Research Center. Amelia is designed as an efficient 150-passenger airliner capable of short takeoffs and landings. The Waveforms and Sonic Boom Perception and Response Project gathered data from more than 100 volunteer Edwards residents about their reactions to low-noise booms created by NASA FA-18 test aircraft. With Whisper, we're trying to get a readback from the people on the ground to some kind of annoyance level. How annoying was this low boom? How annoying was this more moderate uh, boom? NASA's Supersonics Project is embarking on a new effort to characterize that fainter side of sonic booms in the Far Field Investigation of No Boom Threshold Project, or FAINT. They tend to be uh, a lot quieter, uh, probably about five to ten times quieter than your, your normal in-wave sonic boom. NASA's 
always trying to uh, push research, push boundaries, and one of the things we're trying to do is to bring commercial supersonic travel uh, to the world. Out at Edwards Air Force Base near the Dryden Flight Research Center, the remotely piloted X-48C aircraft successfully got its first flight under its aeronautical belt. The X-48C is an X-48B blended wing body aircraft that's been modified to evaluate the low speed, stability, and control of a low noise version of a possible future hybrid wing body design. The HWB design stems from NASA's N plus two future concepts studies under the agency's environmentally responsible aviation project. Aero Day on the Hill provided an opportunity for representatives of NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate to visit Capitol Hill and brief members of Congress on the research the agency is conducting to make air transportation more efficient, safe, and environmentally friendly. We are setting the vision for the country and we are leading the aeronautics community. So it's all about direct, tangible, compelling benefit that you can enjoy today and years to come. Hi, I'm Scott Colorado, Chief Architect for Ground Systems and Development and Operations at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. I'm at Launch Complex 39B where we are building a launch complex for the future and you are watching This Year at NASA. With the final flight of the Space Shuttle program in 2011, the shuttles themselves were delivered in 2012 to their new homes to begin a new chapter in their careers, inspiring museum goers of all ages. Escorted by a NASA T-38 jet, Space Shuttle Discovery atop the NASA 905 shuttle carrier aircraft made its much anticipated arrival in the Washington DC metro area. I got goosebumps. Uh, I was watching it through my, uh, my telephoto lens as it went over the Wa Lincoln Monument down here and uh, really uh, impressed me emotionally. Today, we turn discovery over to the Smithsonian with great expectation that as we have always done, NASA will continue to inspire the young people of today and tomorrow to dream of space to dream of uncovering the secrets of the universe and take steps to pursue the careers that will make them the exploration leaders of tomorrow. Space Shuttle Enterprise concluded its voyage when NASA's first space shuttle made its much anticipated arrival by way of barge on the Hudson River to its new home, the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum. It is a great day for NASA, for uh, America, and for the people who live here in Southern California. The fact that the space shuttles were, were developed here, uh, built here just down the road, and Endeavour is coming back on our last ferry flight on the 747 uh, is a wonderful thing. Space shuttle Endeavour began the final leg of its journey, a two-day, 12-mile parade through the streets of LA to the California Science Center. Endeavour's route took it past several well-known landmarks was captured from above by the Goodyear blimp and was witnessed by thousands upon thousands of Angelinos who came out for a peek at NASA's youngest space shuttle. Meanwhile, Atlantis, the last NASA space shuttle to fly in space, also became the last to be officially retired. Beginning at the Kennedy Space Center's Vehicle Assembly Building, Atlantis rolled the 10 miles to the KSC Visitor Complex, where it will go on permanent public display. It is my sincere hope that one day uh, some young boy or girl is going to look at Atlantis and it's going to spark that dream of exploration in space. Hi, this is Becky Dubasan, Deputy Director at the NASA Shared Services Center, where we strive each and every day to provide timely, accurate, customer-focused support to NASA. You're watching This Year at NASA. This Year at NASA saw America's space agency broaden its connection to the American people through its award-winning web-based and social media programs. NASA's first multiplayer online game to test players' knowledge of the space program has been launched into orbit on Facebook. Space Race Blastoff, 
questions players about NASA history, technology, science, and pop culture. We really hope this will reach a, a, a different audience. Uh, an audience that may not be that interested in, say, coming to the website and reading a long feature story, but wants to sort of test itself out against uh, how much they already know. Astronaut Joe Acaba shared recollections and a video about his stay aboard the ISS with 150 social media followers at NASA headquarters in Washington. It's a cool experience and it, you don't come back the same and you just, it's like any life experience. It can't help but uh, to change you and to change your perspective on the world. NASA television helped observe the last transit of Venus. We'll see here on Earth until 2117 by showcasing live streaming websites the world over, including observations made by scientists in Central Australia. There are just a few clouds in the sky and we are set up for an absolutely gorgeous first and second contact. And by the NASA EDGE team stationed atop the Mauna Kea Observatory okay. in Hawaii. I'm going to look until I put my blinders down. Yes. And now, well, of course, now I can't see anything. Scientists at NASA headquarters also provided information and insight about this rare yet predictable celestial phenomenon that has captivated humankind for millennia. The interest and reaction generated worldwide by Curiosity's trek to and landing on the Red Planet has been phenomenal. People in New York City's Times Square watched a giant screen and listened on Third Rock Radio to NASA Television's coverage of the vehicle's seven-minute, 13,000 to zero miles per hour plunge to the surface of Mars. NASA TV also had more than 1.2 million people watching on NASA.gov. Among those instrumental in Curiosity's success are American small businesses, one company, ATA Engineering hosted a Google Plus Hangout with NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden and Small Business Administration Administrator Karen Mills. A Google Plus Hangout is a group video chat. The Herndon, Virginia firm partnered with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to test and analyze Curiosity's entry, descent, and landing. The Kennedy Space Center has been Googled. In celebration of the center's 50th anniversary, KSC and Google Maps with Street View are providing space enthusiasts with virtual tours of the cavernous vehicle assembly building, launch pad 39A, and other unique facilities used to help launch humans to the moon and space shuttles to low Earth orbit. You can now use the internet and a smartphone for an inside look at the groundbreaking science and technology research being done on board the International Space Station. Log on to the agency's Space Station Live webpage or download the companion ISS Live mobile app to get up to the minute information on experiments NASA astronauts are conducting 240 miles in space for the benefit of all on Earth. The highly anticipated Angry Birds Space is out. Produced by Rovio in cooperation with NASA, the game is not only charming and challenging, but also informing players worldwide about the physics of microgravity. In the course of play, gamers are treated to a glimpse of the NASA meatball atop the International Space Station. I'm standing at the Landing and Impact Dynamics Research Facility here at NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Hi, I'm Susan Gorton, the Rotor Wing Project Manager. The testing and analysis that we do in our project makes helicopters faster, quieter, safer, and more efficient. And you're watching This Year at NASA. 2012 was also a year of change for NASA, marked by the retirement of two spaceflight stalwarts, astronauts Jerry Ross and Shannon Lucid. And sadly, 2012 also saw the passing of others near and dear to NASA. Ralph McQuarrie, whose sci-fi artwork was featured in major motion pictures and hit TV series, has died. He was 82. McQuarrie's creations included Star Wars characters Darth Vader, Chewbacca, R2-D2 and C-3PO, and the mothership of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Near and dear to NASA is the animation McQuarrie produced for CBS News of Apollo 11's landing on the moon in 1969. The future of mankind depends upon space travel, and they will get away from war. If we stay on Earth, we'll go on having wars, 
But if we go to the moon and Mars, we'll bind ourselves together into one single race, one color, and go into space and live forever. The NASA family is mourning the loss of retired astronaut Alan Poindexter. Poindexter, a captain in the U.S. Navy, flew on two space shuttle missions. He was the pilot of Atlantis on STS-122 in 2008, and in 2010 served as commander on board Discovery during STS-131. It meant a lot to me to have the opportunity to go into space, and it meant a lot to me to be the first woman that was chosen. When Sally Ride passed away recently at age 61, she left a legacy of accomplishment and inspiration. As the first American woman in space, Ride proved there was nothing to which a young girl could not aspire. And as a former astronaut, she continued to reassure young women, and young men too, that careers in science and exploration can be exciting, fun, and rewarding. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden joined other agency officials and dignitaries at the Washington National Cathedral to honor the life and career of astronaut Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon, who died August 25th. Neil Armstrong left more than footprints and a flag on the moon. In fact, as President Obama said in a letter, future generations will draw inspiration from his spirit of discovery. The imprint he left on the surface of the moon and the story of human history is matched only by the extraordinary mark he left on the hearts of all Americans. Fate looked down kindly on us when she chose Neil to be the first to venture to another world and to have the opportunity to look back from space at the beauty of our own. No one, no one, but no one could have accepted the responsibility of his remarkable accomplishment with more dignity and more grace than Neil Armstrong. Farewell, yes, but never forgotten. The inspiration of those spaceflight pioneers lives on in each remarkable achievement, special spaceflight moment, an instance of NASA's awesomeness, like these of 2012. As one small step for man. Responding to public demand, NASA has created a companion image to its new Blue Marble picture of Earth in stunning high definition. Blue Marble 2012 is a composite image captured during six separate orbits by the SUMI National Polar Orbiting Partnership Satellite or SUMI NPP. The original blue marble was photographed by the crew of Apollo 17 as they traveled to the moon in 1972. So man meets machine aboard the International Space Station. Another first inside the space station. Expedition 30 Commander Dan Burbank and Robonaut completed the first handshake between a humanoid robot and an astronaut in space. Robonaut is designed with a dexterity to complete work in space, typically performed by humans. The Kennedy Space Center hosted several events to celebrate 50 years of Americans in orbit. Roger, the clock is operating. We're underway. John Glenn, the first to achieve the goal, made his three-orbit flight in Friendship 7 on February 20th, 1962. It's been 50 years. It's hard for me to believe that. It seems like just a couple of weeks ago to me. Three months later, fellow Mercury astronaut Scott Carpenter followed Glenn with his flight aboard Aurora 7 on May 24, 1962. The discovery of a dinosaur track on the campus of Goddard Space Flight Center has scientists a buzz about the area's ancient past. And I love the paradox. Here, space scientists may walk along here, and they're walking exactly where this big, bungling, heavy, armored dinosaur walked maybe 110, 112 million years ago. Weems says there's a much smaller, similar looking footprint inside the larger one, made perhaps by a young notosaur who was traveling with an adult. This probably was uh, a breeding area for many of them based on so many small ones being found. But such well-preserved adult notosaur tracks are rare on the East Coast and make this such a unique find. 
He's been to infinity and beyond, but now Buzz Lightyear is at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum's Moving Beyond Earth Gallery. The action figure, which flew on Space Shuttle Discovery to the International Space Station in 2008, was donated to the museum. Video taken from the International Space Station documents the May 20th annular solar eclipse. While flying at about 240 statute miles above Earth, NASA astronaut Don Pettit captured the moon's shadow being cast on the planet below as the moon lined up between the sun and the Earth. Last year, Irish-American astronaut Katie Coleman celebrated her St. Patrick's Day playing two Irish instruments while she orbited the Earth aboard the International Space Station. This year, Coleman was on center stage at the Kennedy Center in Washington to return the antique wooden flute and shiny tin whistle to its owners, internationally acclaimed recording artist Patty Maloney and the Chieftains. And here she was talking and she was showing the flute and everything was floating and her hair was sticking up. This It was magic. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Hi, I'm Stephen Colbert, and you're watching This Year at NASA on NASA TV. And that's This Year at NASA. For more on these and other stories, or to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and other social media, log on to www.nasa.gov. May your holidays be happy and bright, and our 2013 a success.